Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today I'm gonna try really hard. I got home from work and I'm like, I need to bang out this Extreme Venomverse series. So we're gonna do it in two episodes. In this episode, we're gonna discuss issues one, which I have two covers of, which means I'll have two digital codes to give out at some point. And then I have issue two, and then issue three. And we're just gonna kinda go over my brief thoughts. I'll break down each story, just like summarize it really quickly and just kinda give you my general thoughts on it. So we'll do that for the first three issues in this episode, and then we'll do four and five. And hopefully I get all this stuff you know, up and posted before my surgery, definitely. So probably not before Death of Venom Verse 1 comes out, but hopefully before issue two comes out. But if not, you know, definitely by issue three. Um, and then what we'll do is with Death of Venom Verse, once I'm recovered, I'll start um, you know, recovering. You know, As I'm recovering, I guess uh, I'll read those books. Uh, any that are out at the time and then I'll you know make my videos on them once I feel better so yeah I'm trying to stockpile some stuff now get some stuff ready for you guys and edited and hopefully these are all going up you know one day after another and I'll try to I have some other things I'm going to record in a couple days from now um, like with Venom issue 20 through 23 so I'm going to try to get all this stuff done and have it for you guys so hopefully I am hopefully I'm doing a good job and if I'm late on them I apologize it seems to be the case with me a lot lately so I really do apologize and I appreciate your patience with these videos. So now let's dive in. Let's sink our teeth into Extreme Venomverse, uh, issue one here. And then boom, there's the digital code. First person to put that digital code in gets the comic book. And I'd love to hear your thoughts of this book down in the comments down below and what you think, uh, you know, what your favorite is. If you have a favorite of the three stories in this issue or if, you know, or if you like them all, whatever it is, I'd love to hear it down below. So in this first storyline by Ryan North and Paulo Sakura, uh, I believe that's how you say Paolo's last name. I hope so. Um, this is an Eddie Brock that becomes Spider-Man. It actually starts off from Amazing Spider-Man, you know, the issue where, or I think it's Web of Spider-Man, number one, where the, you know, Peter separates himself from the symbiote and you know, using the church bells. And that's obviously when it goes down into the church itself and it bonds to Eddie Brock. But before it did, remember, as its last act, as Peter felt regret, you know, he felt regret like never telling Aunt May, you know, she was mad at him for not going to school, um, you know, Black Cat, Mary Jane, all these things, all these regrets Peter had. So the suit was separating from Peter with regret and decided to come back and grab him and pull him to safety so that the church bells ringing wouldn't just, you know, cause, you know, his brain to shut down. It was just popping his eardrums and it was, it was hurting him, but he did it to separate himself from the symbiote and the symbiote came back and saved him before it slinked down into the rafters and then ended up on Eddie Brock. Well, in this universe, the symbiote does not save Peter. It comes back for him and thinks about it and decides not to. And then from there, feels a guilt for not saving him, you know, for kind of going against what Peter was trying to teach it in a way by saving people. It decided not to. It falls down into the rafters again, ends up bonding to Eddie Brock and bringing with him that feeling of regret and those memories of Peter, uh, and then in its grief, bonded to Eddie under different circumstances, different feelings and emotions going through it, and thus creating Eddie Brock, Spider-Man. So pretty neat. It's a neat storyline. He, he battles against uh, Dr. Octopus, who instantly knows he's not the same Spider-Man. He's like, yeah, you're not Peter Parker. You're not, you know, you know the kid who died. You're someone different. And, uh, and Eddie's like, yeah, I know, but we're, um, we're still going to live up to the Spider-Man name. So I kind of like that because in this one, you know, Eddie does get a moment to shine, you know, without the symbiote and fight against Dr. Octopus. But then he gets a moment where he could kill Dr. Octopus and he chooses not to. He decides to, you know, web him up and bring him to the authorities. And then thus the ending of a lot of these stories begins where uh, Anne Wang from a different universe, as we've seen, is traveling around trying to recruit members of Venoms to battle against Carnage, who is currently traveling the multiverse to kill Venoms. <laughs> so this was already set up previously. So, um, you know, I wish though there was maybe one more issue that kind of just set up all this up a little bit better, but we, I think you get it. You know, I feel like a lot of this is written for hardcore comic fans. They don't write a lot of comics to appeal to the masses. If the masses find them, great. Hopefully they still like them. But I feel like this series, they're like, you know what, we're just going to for people who read Carnage and Deadpool and Venom Monthly and Red Goblin, like for people who keep up with all the symbiote stuff, this is just going to be an inside baseball kind of approach where you just get it. You know, like you already you got enough to where you can follow it. And so here we go. Anne Wang showing up and recruiting this Spider-Man, Venom, uh, to be part of her team. So that's what you're going to see a lot. A lot of these stories end either with Carnage killing a Venom variant or... 
um, you know, Ann Wang showing up and recruiting them. Sometimes there's a third option and we'll, we'll talk about those, but for the most part, that's what you get. So that's what we have in issue one for the first storyline. The second storyline called All in the Family, uh, the first one was called The Best Part of Him, uh, which I like. I thought that was a cool title. But All in the Family is by uh, Mirka Andolfo and Nico Leon. And this is a story where Eddie Brock and Ann Wang are married and they have their son Dylan and they're a full, you know, a full family, essentially. But uh, the symbiote, you know, having bonded to Eddie and then bonding to Anne at one point, making her she-venom and keeping the codex in her, she has a venom in her still, like a part of venom. And then Eddie has his venom. And now Dylan is a product of two symbiotic parents and human parents having a child. So he's, you know, kind of like an anomaly, kind of like he is in the main universe. Uh, and he, so he, you, his powers lash out. He becomes a version of Venom, breaks out of the house on accident, I think during a, a, you know, just hormones or whatever. And he comes across this young girl who's homeless named Leah and the two of them build a friendship. But then as she is like saying, yeah, you know, parents, they're the worst, you know, mine threw me out, you know, you know, Dylan doesn't want to hear that. He's like, I got good parents. I just, I don't know why I acted the way I did. And it causes the rage to come out of him and he turns into his version of Venom, which causes his parents to come and try to stop him and essentially rescue him from losing control. Because he's, he's a young kid, he's, he's starting to develop these abilities and he is different as a human symbiote hybrid. He is different than his parents. So they're trying, you know, they're fighting him, <laughs> you know, uh, but they're just trying to get him to calm down. And eventually they do. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty good issue. You know, Anne has a really good moment in there where she comes in and she's like metaphorically helping you know in in their mind bonding their you know minds together through the symbiotes helping dylan and also physically fighting him too to kind of knock the symbiote off of it, its guard so that way she can enter its mind and, and help dylan and stuff so they eventually come to an understanding and and you know walk away as a, as a happy family uh and have dinners and invite leah over and kind of i think it maybe not adopt her but at least allow her to come in and have dinners with them from time to time uh, since she's homeless. So yeah, you know, it's neat to see. I always say this about Batman, where the the Nolan Batmans, I like that one to an extent because it ends with a happy ending for Bruce Wayne. And we don't normally get, you know, Bruce Wayne having a happy life, you know, or a potential happy life. And this is neat because you see them having a happy life. And this is one of those moments where no one is recruited. And I'd like to think it's because Anne Wang saw this and was like, Dude, they're a happy family. Like, I don't want to bring one of them into this war and one of them die and then break up that family. So I'm I'm assuming that's the reason no one here is recruited. And luckily, none of them are killed either by Carnage. So it's nice to know that somewhere out there in the multiverse, there's a happy ending for Eddie Brock uh, and Anne Wang and their family. So, yeah, really cool. Um, the, and then the third storyline, the last one, is called Tip of the Blade. It's by Leonardo Romero and Roberto Poggi, who does the artwork. And the artwork is really cool. Um, this is a story of a samurai venom. <laughs> there's, it's kind of like Final Fantasy VII a little bit. There's like a Midgard. There's like the the rich family, you know, rich world built on top of the old city. So all the ruins are down here where the homeless and and the downtrodden live. And then everyone who has money and who's like middle class and upward all live in the new city above. Um, and then they're smuggling. There's this train smuggling people out who want to work who want to just be free of, of the tyranny of this town uh, or city, and they want to get out. So everyone's taking this train, but on the train, they have kind of a stowaway. <laughs> Not really a stowaway, but uh, Takamoto is uh, the person who is is Venom, and they stole this blade that is being tracked by Oscorp. And I think it's Beetle, maybe? Like, I don't know. It's like a flying uh, enemy. Uh, not vulture-like flying, but like almost like how Beetle is in the Ultimate Universe. So there's a Beetle-type character and Scorpion-type character that are tracking Takamoto. Um, so here's the Scorpion character here. And they're kind of drawn with anime inspirations, you know. Uh, it's not a full anime style, the art, um, but it is uh, inspired, I think, by. And then so Takamoto becomes the Black Spider or, you know, uh, Samurai Venom and fights back to save people. And that's pretty much what it is. It's like a single location story. It's on this train. These enemies by Oscorp are coming to attack and uh, and everyone's fighting back, you know. And uh, and you get these cool moments where there was one moment where someone rescued Samurai Venom and I kind of I was like, "Ah, come on, let Samurai Venom cut loose." But they do by the end of the story. They let Samurai Venom cut loose and they grow their fangs, uh, very samurai armor looking, which I like. 
uh, and they get their revenge on Scorpion and this uh, flying beetle character. Um, so yeah, pretty neat. It's a, it's a neat story. Here's the uh, beetle character, who I think is the beetle. Um, but I don't know if you, if someone out there knows who it is, uh, you know, let me know. Um, but anyway, that they call it the red light because they're like, oh, we see this buzzing red light. And I'm like, oh, that, that could be the beetle. I think that happened in Ultimate Comics. So either way, whoever the villains are, they get their butts handed to them. And uh, and then Samurai Venom gets recruited by Anne Wang. So that is the end of the first issue there. Uh, that is, uh, I would say, pretty neat. I mean, it's just these are, uh, you know, they did this with Edge of Venomverse, Edge of Spider-Verse, where they just kind of go, OK, we're going to going to tell you like these 10 page stories featuring these characters or eight page stories and uh, and just kind of just introduce you to a lot of people because some of them are going to show up again and some of them aren't, obviously. But it's just to kind of paint the bigger picture that there's a carnage out there going through the multiverse to kill. And there's an Anne Wang Venom, uh, Agent Venom, going out there recruiting everybody. And from what I understand, it is the same Anne Wang from that Donny Cates world where she met Eddie and Dylan um, in that alternate universe storyline with the maker and stuff. So that's pretty cool. So I'm glad they're doing something more with that version of Anne. And I'm curious to see where that story goes in Death of Venomverse. So we got issue one out of the way. So let's knock out issue two, which has another group of really weird <laughs> versions of Venom. One that kind of feels very into continuity based, which I liked. And then the other two, which start off, one of them starts off continuity based. And then the other one just goes way out there, which I like too, uh, which is in the 1602 universe. So for the first story, we have this Black Cat type story here. And it is called The Sinister Secret of Black Cat's New Costume. This is actually written by Al Ewing with art by Vincent Karatu, um, who I think we've mentioned on this channel before. And Vincent's artwork is really good. I think Vincent has done some stuff for the um, the Black Cat stuff that Jed McKay was doing. So in this, we had Spider-Man separated from the symbiote, right? Uh, Johnny Storm and Mr. Fantastic helped separate the symbiote. They put it in a jar. They put it in the lab. And Black Cat in this world tailed Spider-Man, followed him to the Fantastic Four building, and she breaks in and bonds with the symbiote. And the reason she bonds with it is because she realizes that it was rejected by Peter Parker, much like she kind of was rejected by Peter Parker when he found out she got her powers back and through that whole storyline. So Peter literally is still in the building getting his, you know, the bag put on his head by Johnny Storm um, and hasn't left the, you know, the Baxter building yet and now has to get into a fight with Mr. Fantastic and Human Torch against a black suit, black cat. So uh, again, really cool because it's kind of set in the lore of the of the original comics, and they even reference. They're like, yeah, this this line of dialogue was said in the original comic, and this and this, and this is the moment where it deviates, is where Black Cat decided to follow Peter. She made a choice, and that kind of makes this a what if comic book in a lot of ways, and not just a standard you know Venomverse multiverse story. This deviates from the original timeline, uh, which I really like. And in the end, they realize you know Black Cat tells them. This suit is fine with me and Reed does, you know, uses a ray on it to read its emotional state and he reads it and goes, yeah, this suit is content. It likes being with her because she feels rejected just like it feels rejected. And so there, I'm just going to let them go. We'll monitor them. If she ever loses control, we'll, we'll deal with it at that time. But for now, I think it's going to be okay. And so just know that the symbiote is happy and now Black Cat has found something to be happy about, um, you know, in her kind of rejection, you know, um, mental state. So, uh, so yeah, just kind of cool. And then of course she web, you know, swings off and Anne Wang is watching her and going like, all right, I think we found another member for the team. <laughs> so that was really cool. Again, I'm a big black hat fan and I thought Al Ewing did a good job on this. I, I, you know, I like Jed McKay's voice on black hat, but this felt in line with that. Maybe it's because Vincent did the artwork, but it felt in keeping with that tone and so I dug it, and I thought that was a neat little storyline there. Um, but then we head over to Earth 345 to Rikers Island in a story called Life Model Venom. Um, and this is by David Popose, who is currently doing some Moon Knight stuff, the Moon Knight City of the Dead book uh, that is, uh, that's just about to come out. And then also Ken Lashley, a phenomenal artist who's been drawing comics for years. And in this storyline, we have a Eddie Brock who is um, in jail, Right. And uh, and Dum Dum Dugan is the person who runs S.H.I.E.L.D. on this this world. So it's not exactly like the old world, um, like our like the, the timeline we know. So it's not a complete like one deviation thing. It looks like there's a number of deviations. But Dum Dum Dugan is in charge in this world and has set a trap for the symbiote because Eddie Brock actually is dead in this universe. He was put in a cell with 
you know, with the Cletus Cassidy, and Cletus Cassidy shivved Eddie and killed him before the symbiote showed up and freed him. So because of that, you know, he get this life model decoy version. They're like, we're, he was attacked, and we're transferring him to the rat or to Rikers and everything, and uh, to another room in Rikers. And that's when the symbiote's like, okay, I know where Eddie is. I'm going to go save him. And when it goes in, it bonds to the life model decoy and then gets trapped on the robot. So the, rob the robot is designed by S.H.I.E.L.D. by Dum Dum Dugan to trap the symbiote, keep it bonded to it, um, because there's enough DNA, you know, Eddie's DNA and stuff on it to kind of be human-esque for the suit to bond to, but there's also mostly robotics involved as well. But now the symbiote's trapped. It cannot separate from this life model decoy of Eddie. It has to stay bonded to him. So what it does, though, is, you know, it shows that, hey, I'm not just a dumb creature from space that only bonds to, you know, organic things. I can also manipulate mechanics and stuff. And so it takes control and starts fighting back against Dum Dum Dugan and his team. Uh, just as Carnage, who is popping through different dimensions to kill Venoms, shows up. So Carnage and this Venom get into a big fight. And what sucks, though, is like Carnage is kind of inconsistent. I noticed in a lot of these when he's traveling the different worlds, He's not always in his God form. And I don't know if that's an intentional thing or if it's just artists not, you know, being told that there should be one version of him or whatever. Or maybe they're being told, draw whatever version you want because it really doesn't matter. He's carnage. He's going to adapt to the situation he's in. Maybe that's the reason. I don't know. But either way, it's, Ken, Ken Lashley's artwork's so good that I, I don't care. But I, I just, it was worth noting. I'm like, so maybe one of you know, like, is there, was there a, um, uh, you know any information about that about the carnage cosmic carnage changing shape in these because he just looks like classic carnage here and i was like oh where are the big horns where's you know the the scepter where's all that stuff um so yeah i don't know i was just curious if any of you guys knew the reason for that but this carnage does get in and tries to kill venom but he has a you know a big giant uh chest piece that opens up and shoots a like a cosmic beam out um you know and then blasts carnage away so this is a Venom that actually escaped being, you know, killed by Carnage just as Anne shows up to recruit him. So pretty cool. So life model Venom is uh, is this one. So yeah, he looks cool. Like a techno, you know, robotic Venom I thought was really neat. Uh, and then the last story is on Earth 311 from issue two. And this is called Mask of the Red Death or Mask of Red Death. And this features this guy here, Hieronymus Skelton. Um, Hieronymus Skelton is the jester of this world, of the world 1602, which if you've ever read that comic, um, I think by Neil Gaiman and, and other people that worked on that, that was um, set in the 16, the year 1602. What if the Marvel Universe kind of birthed around that time period? So in this, you know, you have Octavius, uh, you have different lords and everything all culminating at this one castle because there's someone called the Red Death that has been going around and killing jesters at every castle and in every village. And so this is the last jester. And uh, Hieronymus is just hanging out, trying to make people laugh, trying to help them enjoy themselves, and reveals that he is doing that by being Venom. You know, he is a Venom of this universe. And he's kind of a goofball. And he's going around just trying to make people laugh, using his symbiote abilities to, you know, lighten the mood and everything like that. So he's not really much of a fighter. But he, um, he does get into a little scrap here because obviously the Red Death shows up. Not looking like how you think he's gonna, but eventually he does by turning into Carnage. So yeah, big battle happens there. Carnage versus Jester Venom. And uh, and then, you know, there's only one winner though, because in this one, no one really makes it out alive. Carnage is continuing his powers as he kills each Venom. He's absorbing them and, and getting a little bit more powerful. And as we're seeing here, as more black is starting to appear on his suit. So even though he already had like a God form before, I guess he's still evolving in new ways after the Carnage one shot we talked about recently where um, where he you know went to the world where there was the symbiote Spider-Man Craven versus the you know Cletus Cassidy Venom. So uh, so yeah, so he's slowly evolving and, and building himself up and leading us into the final book that we're going to talk about today, issue three of Extreme Venomverse. Again, I'm just breaking down the overall story, talking about some spoiler points because I'd love to hear your thoughts on these as well. And so, yeah, of course we're getting into spoilers in this, but I still encourage all of you to go out there. I'm not just wanting to regurgitate these stories and tell you every single beat. Uh, I'm telling you some of the major ones, but I still think you should go out there and read them yourself because a lot of these are really, really fun. And it's always cool to dip into 
the multiverse and see other versions of our favorite character like Venom in, in these books here. So this one is really interesting too. This one is actually um, from issue three. The first storyline is called Greatness and Catastrophe. And I kind of like that as a theme because I think that is a good theme for you know Venom. We have power and responsibility for Spider-Man, but Greatness and Catastrophe is really fitting for Eddie because he could be either. He could do great things or he could be a total catastrophe, you know? And I kind of like that. Same with his story with the symbiote. It could lead to great things or it could be something that is, you know, not so good. And so that's what this story here is where they introduce the Black Fang, where we're on this planet that the Kree is overlooking that has humans on it. And they're kind of primitive humans. And they're, you know, they have, they're making fire and they're making spears and all that stuff. And the Kree are watching over them with their high-tech weapons. And then a meteor crashes and ends up bonding to this young lady who was uh, kicked out of her village. And so she has been separated from her people and uh, and had like a tiger wolf type animal friend. But when the meteor crashed, it killed that animal. But the symbiote emerged kind of replicating that animal and then bonding to her and making Black Fang. And this is a story by Jed McKay, speaking of Jed McKay, and Daniel Earls, who does the artwork, who I think does a really good job doing this like primitive world that the Kree are looking over. And so Black Fang runs around, beats up all the Kree, kills them, fights their big secret weapon, this giant robot. And just as the robot though is about to kill her, and that's what I like that, that this character Black Fang isn't immediately overpowered. She takes out the Kree, but this giant robot is gonna kill her. It's about to kill her until Anne Wang shows up and saves her. And, and then there's a cool moment at the end of you know whether she's accepted or not, uh, Black Fang by her village who kicked her out. And that ultimately, that decision, you know, what happens there leads her to talking to Anne and seeing like what else she can, you know, do and contribute to. So it looks like she might be the newest member of Anne's team by the end of this book. So, or by the end of that story. But really, really cool. Again, just another out there multiverse storyline, but I like that it was set on a primitive earth. Uh, this book, I feel like gives us some really interesting different takes on Venom, but also brings back uh, kind of a... Not a fan favorite in a way, but uh, a version that didn't live very long um, in the comics, uh, which is Venom Space Knight. Uh, but we'll get there because the second story here actually brings Web Slinger or Gunslinger Spider-Man into it. It's like set in the Wild West and it's called Best Little Horror House where we get to meet Madame Brock. And Madame Brock is the, you know, the Venom, Madame Venom or whatever of this universe. Her name is Edna. And, uh, and in this world, we have the Gunslinger Spider-Man saving this woman who was like a, a call girl uh lady of the night whatever you want to call her uh, you know she was working at this place in this village and this guy was beating her and that's against the rules so the guy who runs the establishment you know stops it from happening and then confronts the guy who was hitting the woman and he says no i'm gonna actually kill you all and he pulls out a knife but that's when gunslinger shows up and stops him so for saving his life this owner of this establishment is like, hey, you know, come back with me. I'm going to introduce you to Madame Brock. She's going to read your future. Uh, and she's going to tell you that, you know, we could use your help because there is something coming. There is some trouble coming. And it turns out that trouble comes in the form of the guy that he already stopped. Um, you know, the, the guy who pulled out the knife, he shot the knife out of his hand, but the guy ran away to get his posse and is bringing him back to this, you know, place of business where uh, Gunslinger Spider-Man is getting his you know tarot cards read and hearing about his future by Madame Brock here, who does have a symbiote. She's kind of like a Madame Web type, uh, but she has a symbiote and she pulls out this whip and just starts beating the crap out of these guys with her symbiote whip. Um, and Gunslinger Spider-Man's there to help too. And then also some of the girls who were beaten get some revenge as well. So a really cool moment, but the big thing is, is at the end, when Web Slinger Spider-Man is healed and he's ready to ride off into the sunset, Madam Brock is like, yeah, um, you know, I know you're watching me. And then this woman comes out of the barn and she's like, I know, I known about you all along. So, you know, how do, how do I join your team? And she pulls out a tarot card that shows the queen of swords and she shows it to Anne Wang, who has uh, been hiding out, uh, keeping an eye on the situation to see if Carnage would show up. And since he didn't, she's recruiting Madam Brock now to join the team. So yeah, pretty neat. Again, another cool, neat storyline and a, a departure because we had, like, you know, the, the Wild West, and, and then we had a primitive Earth, and then now we have a super future space Earth, where we have Venom, Flash Thompson, as the Space Knight. This book didn't last very long. You know, Flash wasn't Space Knight very long, maybe like a year, year and a half in the comics, 
where he was Space Knight and then also in the Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is kind of taking a cue from that. Like, what if he kept going as the Space Knight and kept being the Space Knight of the Venom universe? And he goes against these uh, this creature Titus um, and battles to save people that are being um, captured and tortured and families being separated throughout space. It's like a alien trafficking story. And Venom is, is stopping Titus from that. It's called Wetworks. And it is by Clay McLeod Chapman, who we in, you know interviewed on the channel. And that episode will be going up very soon. And then also Nelson Daniel. Um, and Nelson Daniel did the artwork on this. So really, really cool. I, yeah, I dug this story a lot. I thought this was fun to see Flash at it again. Um, but he kind of does an OP thing at the end a little bit where he crash lands on a planet by turning the symbiote into a spaceship and making it through the atmosphere, which should burn him. But again, we don't know if it's Earth's atmosphere. But either way, it's an Earth-like planet, and he crashes on it, and Anne Wang is there to recruit him. So that would be the end of this issue. But we have a couple little fun stories in the back by T uh, Ty Templeton, who does these fun little comic strips, like kind of like a Sunday comics thing. So we got Tales of the Black Costume, where you have uh, you know, the symbiote walking around uh, and getting beat up by Mr. Fantastic. And then you have Carnage and Cleat which is cool. So these are all references to, you know, really great Sunday morning or Sunday uh, cartoon strips and comic books like Family Circus. We have Family Symbiote. Um, so that's another one-shot story there. And then Clintar, the Killjoys. Uh, really, really funny. So I'm not going to dive into those. I just thought they were fun that they put those in here. And they got Ty Templeton to do these four little short stories. So all of those, the Black Costume, or Tales of the Black Costume, Carnage and Cleat, Family Symbiote, and Clintar, the Killjoys, make up, uh, you know, Tales... 10, 11, 12, and 13 in this episode. So yeah, you get 13 worlds in the first three issues of Extreme Venomverse. That's pretty good. Um, even though you don't spend a lot of time in most of them, you spend enough time to where you kind of get the gist of what they're doing and what they're setting up. And obviously you get the idea that, okay, Death of Venomverse is going to be all these heroes that were recruited here um, are going to be a part of it, but also all the, the ones or all the Venoms that died at the hands of Carnage, they are now a part of Carnage and you're going to see them probably their powers or abilities used in some way, hopefully during Death of Venomverse, um, as they've been absorbed into Carnage. So obviously we have issues four and five coming up next. So I will probably record those either tonight or tomorrow. Um, you know, and I'll try to get them recorded and edited and get these out to you guys. But yeah, I'm, you know, I, I like this a lot so far. They're fun. They're just fun. It's kind of like what we did with our episode 800. We just had fun talking about what our favorite Venom would be and like what our take on the character would be in a multiverse story. And that's clearly what's going on here. And I can tell that everyone's just kind of having a lot of fun with it. So we'll get more into that in the next two uh, issues when we talk about four and five. But for now, my review, at least of the first three issues, I would say um, overall, I'd probably give them like a three to three and a half. Uh, they range between issues. Some I thought were a little bit stronger than others, but overall as a concept so far, it's fun and I like it, so I'd stick it between the three and the three and a half stars marker um, out of five because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And the art on a lot of these is fantastic. Uh, and I'm, I'm being exposed to some new artists, names I have seen before, but some I haven't. And that's always fun. You always want to put like a Ken Lashley on a book, but then also add some other artists on there that people might not know about. To you know, That's the whole point of it, like anthology book, is to broaden your horizons, make you fans of other people. And I think I'm going to be a fan of some new people at the end of this book. So... Let me know what you think down below. Um, again, uh, Taryn Killam, he wrote the Madame Brock story. Rod Reyes did the artwork on it. Jed McKay and Daniel Earls did the you know Black Fang one. And then Clay McLeod Chapman and Nelson uh, Nelson Daniel did ish, the, the final one, along with Ty Templeton, who did uh, the little four short stories at the end. So I don't know if I credited them all you know during the episode, but I'm just crediting them now So because I, I was talking gushing about everyone who worked on this book and I didn't even mention a couple of them. So there, I think that covered me for everyone. So thank you for watching the show as always. Let me know what you think of this uh, of these three episodes or issues down in the comments below. I'd love to hear if you have a favorite Venom out of these three so far, a least favorite, do you like them all? I'd love to hear your thoughts down below and we'll keep talking down there. Thanks so much for watching the show as always. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.